I don't think Threads is going to take over Twitter. That's it. I'm not that bearish on it. People just want to log in and read stuff about sports and their stars and this and that. They don't necessarily want to have a fight with Noah Smith about you know, housing policy in Portland or something or whatever the hell, <laughs> right? It's a very small set of people who do want to do that. <laughs> to be blunt, less interesting version of that. If you can't quite get a viral tweet going, then I guess LinkedIn will have to do. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I, I think for a certain set of people, Twitter actually is the LinkedIn. But you have to have, I mean, look, to be anybody in Silicon Valley these days, what do you have to have? A startup, a rolling fund, an actual hacker space, and a 100K plus, you know, follower account. If not, you're not on the map, right? So that, that's the place for Twitter. But if, you know, you're like marketing lead for random company X, you're on LinkedIn and pursuing the same goals, but in a very different context, I think. That, that to me is kind of yeah. what, what LinkedIn is. Link- it's like the business influencer minor leagues. I scroll LinkedIn and I want to go and become a communist. I just get so offended at like the capitalist striving and all this bullshit. I literally just want to don a beret and go into the hills with a machine gun. Let's get into it. Eugene, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining a moment of Zen. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, Eugene, you, you recently wrote a blog post, uh, How to Blow Up a Timeline. W- why don't you unpack what you were trying to say about Twitter in, in, in that piece, and we'll get into it. Yeah, I think I had been talking to a lot of people who were like me, had used Twitter for a long time, and a lot of us had met each other on Twitter and gotten used to kind of hearing from each other regularly on Twitter, and we all sensed that something was off, something was different. Um, you know, for example, I follow the three of you on Twitter, and you know, at one point I was like, oh, I haven't heard from those guys in a while. I wonder why that is. They usually tweet like fairly regularly. And then I went and checked and, oh, you have been tweeting. I just didn't see stuff from you um, as frequently anymore. And that was happening for a lot of people that I followed. And um, so, you know, it's always hard with social media algorithms to know what's actually happening behind the scenes. Uh, but I think if you use a service long enough, you you have this sort of like intuition that something has switched the way that, you know, YouTubers or TikTokers can always sense when the algorithm is prioritizing something else. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what, what had happened exactly and why things felt different to me. Um, and my sense was that they had gone to something that was very much like a TikTok style algorithm that heavily weights towards, you know, a certain generic style of engagement or virality. And um, the question to me was why, if you went to that, does that feel different? Why does the community of Twitter feel like um, it has maybe dissipated in a way? And so I just thought about like the evolution of Twitter and how it came to be what it was over time. And, you know, Twitter notoriously is very, um, you know, as a company has been very slow in shipping new features over the years. Um, I think a lot of that felt like an identity crisis. Like Twitter, I think internally always had a lot of disagreement over what it should be and how it should go about being that. And I think a lot of users like, like you three, myself, who are heavy users, had kind of made Twitter into something that worked for them in a very specific way. You, you followed certain people, you muted certain people, you blocked certain people, and, you know, kind of in uh, hand in hand, in, uh, in coordination with the algorithm, we kind of figured out how to make it feel like our little community. And so I think something like a TikTok algorithm, like going to something like that is really fascinating for a system that's reached kind of like a a homeostasis, it resets a lot of things and uh, switches the dynamic. Um, I think some people think it's it's for the better. Um, I think some people think it's for the worse. Um, but I think it's a very specific choice with very specific consequences. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what my piece was about. You know, why does an algorithm like that work really well for a TikTok? Why does it maybe work a little less well for a place like Twitter, where it's hard to really get a very clean read on uh, user sentiment about every tweet. Um, I think it's just, a, I think it's a hard problem. I think like microblogging as a, as a, as a medium um, makes it hard to do a TikTok style algorithm um, at an optimal level. Just the same way that um, if you look at algorithmic music recommendations, they've reached a pretty good point today. But then if you compare that to algorithmic recommendations of podcasts, 
they still have a really, really hard time. Um, so I think every different medium <laughs> is uh, susceptible to a certain style of algorithm uh, to different degrees. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of a high level of my piece. Eugene, do you feel like this had happened to you prior to Elon taking over or is this very much a Elon takes over in November and the feed gets really bad or was it a kind of slow, gradual decline? Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Like I wasn't tracking it so closely. Like I think by the time I noticed, I didn't remember when it had started. Um, it, you know, the, the TikTok style algorithm thing may have preceded Elon. And I don't even know if that was something that he particularly wanted to do or had a hand in, in doing. It may have been something that happened before that. Certainly, I think uh, if you look at Instagram with Reels and everything, they had already gone down the, the road of trying to uh, chase after TikTok and copy them um, earlier. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, and I don't know if you, you three have noticed it at all. Like some people to me have told me that, oh, you know, Twitter seems largely the same. I don't, they don't notice any difference. Um, and I, I've gone back and forth a lot. I go back and forth between the following feed and the for you feed. And I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. Um, what explains the difference between them. And I definitely noticed when they went, um, when they split the two feeds that um, we no longer had a ranked following feed, which I think was the algorithm before, before they like bifurcated the two feeds. Um, now that the following feed is purely chronological, um, that, that was very noticeable to me. The for you feed, I don't know, they may have been tweaking it in any number of ways behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, this is always the thing. As, as a commentator from the outside, it, it's hard. You have to kind of just react to what you see. You don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. Can I make a comment, Eugene? I, it, in my opinion, I think we often credit the algorithm too much for what the platform is. Um, I think in certainly in the case of mm. like the 2016 Trump anti-Facebook tirade, where the algorithm was to be blamed for everything, I always like to highlight that um, products like WhatsApp mm -hmm. have no feed and have no algorithm. And it literally is just mm -hmm. user self-associating and getting into groups. And that already caused all sorts of political yeah. mayhem in India and Brazil and elsewhere. And so I, I do wonder, I, I mean, to me, the most salient thing that's changed about Twitter or in the context of like people going to threads is the people on the network <laughs> have changed. And those who are allowed to speak and what they're allowed to speak and what they're allowed to say, that to me is what's changed, arguably for the better in Twitter than from before. Eugene, you were just saying how you know, it's hard to comment as a as an outsider if when mm -hmm. Elon said he was, uh, you know, when Elon said he was getting a new CEO instead of um, getting Linda, if, if he had picked you, uh, what, what would you have done with the platform? Like, what would your strategy be if you if you were running Twitter? You know, there's two separate things. There's one of Twitter as a, as a business and an ongoing concern, and whether you can make it uh, more profitable and everything. I think if you look at the MAUs for Twitter, what is it like, three hundred fifty million something? in that range. Um, and it's been that way for some amount of time. And I think the big open question is, is there some reason that that's the limit for how big it can be? Like many other users tried it, they gave up on it and we'll never get them back. So there's no use trying. You just try to optimize for that set or could you actually grow it to, you know, 3x that, 4x that, something larger? I don't know, but I think it's worth a try just for the business for a lot of reasons. I think you'd have to figure out, is there some, are there some drastic ways that we could um, change the product to bring many more people onto it? I have this long running sense that Twitter as a product is abstracted at like one level too low for a lot of people and that they kind of just stopped there and were okay with where they were. Um, but that there is a version of Twitter that would be easier to use or understand or comprehend that could have, you know, maybe four X the number of MAUs instead of, instead of where they settled out. I'm not sure what exactly that looks like, but, um, you know, I think the four of us are probably very heavy or experienced Twitter users and, and find it mostly easy enough to use and follow. Um, but as a product person, I always think 
like it's easy to overlook how many people found the product kind of incomprehensible or really hard to use. Um, it reduces, uh, like it, it exposes users to a lot of just weird syntax and things that are just bewildering for a lot of people. And so, you know, I think the power users would stick with Twitter regardless, but to bring in another set of users, you'd have to figure out how to make it easier. And one way to do that, I think, is also, um, I think the smallness of Twitter works against it sometimes. Like it does feel like one big group conversation. And there, we know there are a lot of sub-communities on Twitter. Is there a way to make it feel like they each have their own space? A little bit more like a, a subreddit style where different communities of interest can find each other more easily. Like I think today, if, if you want to find those communities, people kind of like Twitter just kind of relies on you just scanning the timeline and trying to figure it out. Like if there's, a, I don't know, something happening in the sports world or some live thing like the Oscars going on, you can kind of follow the conversation, but it's mixed in with all this other stuff. Um, and people who use Twitter a lot get used to it. They just keep scrolling and they just pick up the context. Um, but I think there are ways to make those types of communities of conversation easier to discover. And uh, I think it's worth a shot. I, I think it's, it's something that Twitter hasn't tried too hard to do. You know, relying on just hashtags or people figuring that stuff out is, um, I think, not going far enough. Um, to meet those communities. So that would be something worth trying, in my opinion. But you think uh, TikTok is the wrong kind of um, mental model or goal for, 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 for Twitter? Like, was it an implementation uh, challenge or just the, the idea of trying to be more like TikTok just doesn't work for a product like Twitter? I think it's fine. I mean, you're always gonna rely on some algorithms that, at that level of scale to try to sift through the signal to noise problem that's inherent to social media. Um, I just think it's hard with their interface to, to get really like clean and negative signal. And so I always feel like Twitter's always stuck at some kind of local maximum. Um, and it's hard, you know, th there's no, there's nothing that says that if they tried something drastically different, they wouldn't fail. Um, like they might fail to bring on users and then alienate the ones that still do like Twitter exactly the way it is. So it's for sure a risk to take, but I don't know if you, you know, paid $44 billion for Twitter and you're trying to <laughs> salvage some amount of that value, you probably do have to take some amount of like big risk to see if there's something else there. You know, I'm with you that like, I don't, I don't quite understand the for you tab. I think the algorithm probably is a little tweaky, but to me, I, I think many people will claim that actually Twitter has gotten better. Right. And I think mm -hmm. it's because the people who've chosen to stay on Twitter versus, for example, go to threads. And I'd love to broach yeah. the threads topic at some point. But what, yeah. but I think what, one thing in your thinking, and, and I worked at Facebook in the like yeah. around the time of the IPO, so I'm very familiar with that form of, of thinking, is that social networks have to go for maximum growth. And what you're mm -hmm. citing that, fa that Twitter has its own internal language. Like, mm -hmm. yes, if you're, if you're trying to beat Facebook, that's correct. Those are all problems. If you're trying mm -hmm. to be the sort of intellectual backplane, by which I mean the way that elites talk mm -hmm. to each other and across networks. Like that's yeah. what matters. What, what matters actually isn't MAUs, it's being mm -hmm. upstream of everybody else. That, that's mm -hmm. the new KPI, so to speak. And I think, mm -hmm. I think in that sense, Twitter is still doing very well. The only thing it's, it's losing to is, in my opinion, group chats, but that's unbeatable because humans, mm -hmm. you're never gonna productize that into a public social network. So to me, yeah. I, I don't know, I would take the other side of it and say that, I mean, sure, mm -hmm. I think the ads model has gone kind of by the wayside and clearly they're losing money and my ads quality has probably gone down. But as a yeah. user experience, I've actually liked Twitter more in the past six months, say, than before. Um, mm -hmm. And I, maybe I'm a little weird, but I suspect, I don't know, Eric and Dan might, might even agree with me on that one. Yeah, it's possible. I, I certainly think that's the risk of trying to be a different thing than it is. Um, like maybe inherent to Twitter's appeal is the fact that it just throws people together chaotically. A lot of people who disagree. It definitely selects, I think, for a certain type of user who's more comfortable with a certain amount of, you know, combative discourse, <laughs> like disagreeability is inherent to that. And part of that is just selecting for, you know, you know it, um, at some point they made the decision to say, well, 
it's not just tweets from people you follow that show up in your timeline. You're going to get tweets that they like, or, you know, um, I don't even know how they do it at this point, but uh, now with the new for you algorithm, you're even going to see um, tweets that are just viral, regardless of, you know, whether anybody you follow follows them. Um, and that means that you will come into contact with a lot of people who disagree with you. Um, and so I do think the people who enjoy that have stayed on Twitter. And then some amount of people who don't like that, maybe they go to threads and, and it is interesting with threads, you know, with Adam explicitly saying that they don't want to optimize for politics and news, um, in a way that's a concession that they won't be as culturally central, at least to that type of conversation, which is really important to elites, you know, in, in the, uh, public intellectual sphere. Like they really want to debate that type of thing. Um, I don't know if that's the right thing or wrong thing for threads to do. Um, uh, because I do think to some extent, maybe Facebook has always envied the fact that Twitter, despite being a small network, is seen as more important for that type of conversation. Eugene, one of the things that came to mind when you were kind of saying Twitter uh, solves for the, the more combative or disagreeable, like I think in your essay, you mentioned it's where introverts go to be extroverts, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to go talk to, I don't know if you said it or someone yeah. said it, but I think it's like, I, I don't actually want to be in a big group of people, but I'm, I'm definitely happy to talk to N number of people on Twitter and, yeah. and potentially engage and get into disagreements yeah. there. Yeah, I, I think one thing on the algorithm, um, and I'd be curious how you think about this, but so obviously working on Farcaster, I spent a lot of time thinking about yeah. short text social from a pure product standpoint that I ever had. Yeah. And we've played around with some of the machine learning stuff and, you know, kind yeah. of like everyone's telling me all this great AI progress is happening. And then mm -hmm. when you ask any of these off the shelf AIs to kind of how do you classify? And I think your, your example was like, how do you classify a drill tweet mm -hmm. where it's like, it's, it's like the CAPTCA for these AIs is like they, they like the the short text format is just not very good because there's actually a lot of subcontext, especially yeah. when there's a different thing or whatever's taking yeah. over the timeline. Like right. how many of the the videos um, that the, whatever that pinky doll video that was yeah. happening, like the jokes that were subtle, like in jokes mm -hmm. that you already needed to have that context, like the AI is just not gonna kind of get it. Yeah, and yeah, I, I think the beauty of if you have a really well crafted follow graph, which again, as a power user right. feature, yeah. that is like the most amazing thing on Twitter, assuming it was who you're following, but then ranked by engagement, because yeah. you've already curated the best and funniest people. And so Twitter just becomes this amazing dopamine experience for yeah. whatever's happening on the internet that day, like you're getting the best set of takes mm -hmm. rather than whatever plays to the algorithm. And I think right. the last part about the, the, the for you algorithm that I disagree with, despite it being what Elon might say is intellectually honest is time spent, the, the Facebook mm -hmm. metric, yeah. getting applied to tweets, it, it, that, that algorithm is going to solve for two things. You're going to get thread boys mm -hmm. and uh, videos, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. like, that's actually not what makes Twitter great. The, the, yeah. What Twitter should be optimizing for is like the pithiest, funniest tweet in a single tweet, like getting a lot of mm -hmm. engagement, that, that is like your currency. That's the thing that Facebook can't do. You know, if you look at TikTok and their algorithm trying to optimize for each individual individual TikTok, each video on TikTok largely does um, stand alone. Um, but like you said, Dan, a lot of tweets are just like they're part of a larger conversation. It might be a reply to something. Uh, the context is is sort of just implied. You know, a lot of people who tweet as if everyone's going to understand the context, but they don't really care if you don't pick up the context. But it just becomes really hard for an algorithm to rank that type of thing because it's meant to be part of a larger conversation in that moment. It's not meant to be like, oh, evaluate me as a standalone tweet. No, this is like one in a, <laughs> a larger conversation. And I also think that people who use Twitter a long time, we've gotten used to the, you know, you open Twitter in the morning and there's some people talking about something and you're not sure what's being referenced. And you're like, okay, I have to be a detective and go figure out what the context is and you figure it out. And so you feel a sense of accomplishment and having mastered that game of like, oh, okay, I jumped into this conversation midstream. Now I got to figure out what they're talking about and then how to insert myself. 
Um, and then there's a certain set of people who are just like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, what are they talking about? Why is it so incomprehensible? So it's tough. It's tough to balance those two things. It might be, you know, the most likely outcome is that Twitter always stays kind of small and kind of, uh, you know, not, not a great business. Um, Threads comes along, takes some amount of traffic, but also isn't that great a business for Facebook either. Um, and, and they both end up sort of mildly suboptimal. Can I quote the line that you did in your piece, Eugene? And I think it's probably the best one line summation of Twitter that Dan was referencing just for the sake sure. of the record here. Yeah. This, this so-called Newtown Square was a 24 seven nightclub for real world introverts, but textual extroverts, my tribe. That's the great line from your piece. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I do think, you know, it's been funny because, um, I've tried out threads a little bit and I've tried out, um, different alternatives to Twitter and. Ultimately, especially if Threads doesn't want to index on politics and news and that type of thing, like we may end up in a world where there's never a direct substitute for Twitter. Like we never find anyone who does that exact thing and it'll stick around forever and it'll be impossible to recruit maybe the purchase price of the company. Like that may just be like, you just have to live with that and be okay with that as, as the business owner. Um, but that it will forever be this a uh, weird corner of the internet that <laughs> no one can ever replicate. You know, it's just like, I know some people are trying to replicate Twitter on threads by trying to find the people that they followed and everything. But, you know, I talk about Mansur Olson in, in my piece because, you know, it's true what he says. It is so hard once a community has some amount of um, growth to just wholesale move that community somewhere else. That coordination problem is is really daunting. And we're seeing even though threads managed to get, I don't know, however many 100 million people through in a couple days. It's still I feel like most of the people I follow on Twitter aren't there yet, and may not ever be there. And so it's never going to be quite the same. I don't know what's have you guys tried threads? I don't know what your experience with it is so far. I think I've officially churned. I mean, I, yeah. I just I don't find it very interesting to see Taylor Lorenz whining about the world next to Wendy's uh, doing little cute cringe pieces on burgers. Like I just, I don't, <laughs> I don't see what the point of that is. I think, yeah. I think you put your finger on it. If you're like a word cell or a little thread boy and you want to get into, you know, disputatious, you know, debates about people, about crazy ideas, Twitter's for you. And it seems to me like threads almost feels like random Instagram comments threaded together. It just feels like it's a, it's, it's, it's like trying to, smell a painting or I, I don't know. It, it just, it's just seems like a category error as a piece of social media. I, I see not, I see almost nothing in it for, for me at least. But yeah, I wonder if, um, cause you know, if, if you say that you don't want to do politics and news, but you do want to be kind of Twitterish in, in, in nature, what you're saying is, well, we want to be kind of the public conversation space for, I don't know, uh, restaurants and travel and fashion and, and things like that. And I think it's an open question to me as to whether those are big businesses in and of themselves. Like it may be just that politics and news and economics and ideas are just more well suited to the microblogging medium. And that, you know, um, the, the comment section for all those other spaces is just not that interesting. I'm not sure. Or, um, or, or those spaces already are on Instagram, right? They're inherently yeah. visual. So like yeah. they, 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 I think that the challenge with, with Facebook is Facebook has never been about public conversations. Like mm -hmm. I, I this probably trigger all the ex Facebook people or whatever they think, but the reality is it, that the products that have actually worked are the, you know, college social network, which is kind of about dating and like, you know, stalking mm -hmm. people with their wall and then yeah. move to Instagram. And then mm -hmm. there are other phenomenally successful products or group chats, but they've yeah. never actually been a good distribution platform. And then obviously Instagram in yeah. its current version with reels, I think is like moving towards being a TikTok and YouTube. But mm -hmm. I think an important point there is that's a broadcast platform. It is not meant to create a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Like you, but when mm -hmm. you put an Instagram post out, like what you're hoping for are DMs or people like sliding into your DMs to tell you how great you are or smashing the like button. 
when yeah. you put a tweet out, like you're, you're kind of looking for engagement or, or like potentially a fight or whatever, whatever thing that you're doing, but like getting a bunch of likes on Twitter versus getting a bunch of spicy replies or, or going back and forth with people, I think is like the yeah. actual, that's the high status thing to do on Twitter or, or even better, you put out something that potentially is wrong. And yeah. then someone comes in and quote tweets you, which, mm -hmm. you know, that brings up their mob and then you get into a fight. I mean, like this just that, that that's Twitter and that doesn't mm -hmm. exist on any other platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm just checking right now, my Twitter thread about pickleball that people are going to shit on and I love it. And it's great. It's like, I, I really think you're right in that it's a set of people like people. I actually, I, I don't think threads is going to take over Twitter. That said, I'm not that bearish on it. People just want to mm -hmm. log in and read stuff about sports and their stars and this and that. They don't necessarily mm -hmm. want to have a fight with Noah Smith about, you know, housing policy in Portland or something or whatever the hell, <laughs> right? It's a very small set of people who do want to do that. Is, is it that yeah. they don't want to talk about politics or is it they only want to talk about politics that, with people that agree with them, right? Like, um, and so does it just, become, just, yeah. does it just become, you know, we have a right wing social platform and a left wing social platform and they both kind of do the, the same thing. And on the right one, there's a lot of debate. And on the left one, it's, it's mostly people who agree. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I w I've always been very super skeptical of the filter bubble theory, by the way, which I know sounds great, but I think it's actually bullshit. I think old previous internet media was way more filter bubbly than we are. I, I was raised in a world pre-internet in which the Miami Herald was the, basically the only newspaper in town and no one saw the New York Times and you were living in a, in a little South Florida bubble. I, I think the, the anguish of Twitter, why it doesn't appeal, what Gina's citing, it doesn't appeal to most people. Most people don't want to be kicked in the face with the okay. counter narrative to the little narrative they're using to like wander through the world. That it's extraordinarily uncomfortable to do that. I think it's a real problem. And most people are just not going to sign up to get kicked in the face every day, which is what Twitter basically is. There might be some optimal level also of um, like for what Twitter solves for, which is like, um, I, I say that, you know, Twitter to me is structurally gladiatorial in its conversational style. Um, I don't know that it has to be that way, but Twitter has optimized for that. And I think they do solve for something that's hard to maintain a conversation like that, which is, I, I think, like if, if you felt like everybody on Twitter that disagreed with you um, wasn't your equal, you would probably get tired of it and leave. But I think Twitter has enough people on all sides of debates that people kind of respect enough to stay around. You're like, okay, yes, occasionally I'm going to get attacked by some random person that I think is an idiot, but there are enough other smart people on Twitter where you will get some good back and forth and that keeps you around um, for long enough. And I think that that's, a, that's going to be a harder thing for threads to solve for. Um, so I, I don't know that they may be part of it. Do you guys remember that um, change my view subreddit? <laughs> uh, vaguely, uh, yeah. talk about it. it was just basically like open minded debate with earnest. They people. were like, yeah, they were like, oh, can we solve for, you know, people disagreeing with each other and have, you know, sort of like friendly uh, or at least respectful debate back and forth. And so you would state an opinion that you had and you would challenge people to change your view on that. And you could award these Delta, like it was kind of like a, a specific form of karma to people who had actually changed your opinion on that topic. And they, it was heavily moderated, you know, like if you said anything, uh, if you attacked anyone personally or anything like that, your comments would get removed. And so it was actually amazingly uh, civil debates around very heated topics. It'd be like, you know, abortion or the death penalty or religion. And, and they eventually broke out of Reddit and formed their own website or company. I think they changed the name slightly. It was like changeofview.com or, or something that I respect. And they tried to make a go of it. And I was actually pretty impressed with the quality of the debate and how civil it was. But then eventually it went under, I think, and they had to shut down. Um, and maybe it says something about the internet that like trying to create healthy civil debate at scale is just not a good business. And, and they ultimately had to, had to close up. And maybe what we're left with is Twitter style kind of, uh, fist fights in the alley. Um, and that's like, maybe what you can, the best you can do for the economics of that business. I'm not sure. 
I, I feel like though that the people that's like a stated preference for people of like they uh -huh. want the civil and uh -huh. the reveal preferences they actually want the the fight video the equivalent mm -hmm. would like they, they 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 just like the spectacle right like they like yeah. the dunk they like the, mm -hmm. the you know the gladiatorial aspect of it and yeah I don't know like part of it is yeah. I, I kind of think about this in a way of like if you actually have a physical town square and you were to be that rude to someone mm -hmm. in person in a prior mm -hmm. era you would have just like maybe they would have beat your ass like in person <laughs> like and, like that that's yeah. not whereas you can like the drake line of like trigger fingers to twitter fingers like you can hide behind the keyboard and you can act like a like kind of like a big um a big person in, in how you want to engage with people from the safety of your of your keyboard yeah yeah it may be that twitter solves for that specific thing and that that specific thing will never be a great business but it'll always be a business that they can dominate and own because no one else will get into it. Like the fact that Threads started off and just said right from the jump, we're not going to do politics and news already told you that they were not even going to go after that specific space that Twitter is in. Um, but it's also interesting to me to see just how much, you know, how kind of path dependent social media is. For threads, you know, they did a lot of things that you might assume are, are uh, very logical things to do as a business, trying to jumpstart a new network. They used a graph that they already had. They um, heavily hand, uh, you know, tuned it so that a bunch of really famous people like JLo got a lot of distribution early on. They tried to solve the cold start problem in any number of ways, but there were probably a bunch of unanticipated downstream consequences of doing that. And that, you know, if people like Antonio and others have already churned, that might have been the price that they didn't know that they were paying by going down that route. Um, I always think about how Pinterest very early on evolved to be so heavily dominated by women. Um, I don't think that they necessarily set out to become that, but a number of decisions they made kind of led them down that path and then kind of like just the runaway network effects of that became dominant. And by the time they tried to unwind that, it was almost impossible. It was too late and they were too far down the road. Um, and that's, I guess, one of the very difficult things about running social media companies or everything is you can say that you're going to like, um, like Facebook style to me, it seems to me to always be to like copy things that have some traction. Um, really quickly and then test and iterate based on data and you can you, you can try to sit back and wait for the data to come in things but you've already maybe foreclosed a bunch of options just by those early decisions that they made um, and they may not be able to just like easily turn it around to be something else. Eugene I wanted to go back to actually something that you mentioned before and and like the, the idea that subreddits um, would be a potential way to solve for um, Twitter, some of Twitter's issues, for, especially mm -hmm. for a more mainstream user, right? If, you're, if your goal yeah. here is to like 4X the number of people yeah. using Twitter. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's interesting, like I, we're actually doing this with Farcaster and experimenting yeah. with it, we're calling it channels. And, and, and yeah. the, the, I think that the fundamental challenge here is the mm -hmm. beauty of Twitter, mm -hmm. if you're like a power Twitter producer, right? Like you're creating yeah. the supply on the network, is you kind of just love the idea that you can open up this app press a button, shoot off your thought, boom, like go on with the rest of your day. You can pull the back app back up and you can get into a fight with people if you want. Yeah. You know, it, it just becomes this uh, right. amazing video game if, if you're good mm -hmm. at it and you have distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Really difficult game if you don't already, haven't crossed the chasm in terms of distribution and it's like, how right. am I ever going to get noticed and all the kind of you yeah. know, like reply guy and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that the challenge of that is like, and, and, one good example is like Reddit has never become mainstream from a like public like discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your identity is tied with it, like elites using yeah. it. It's like Reddit is basically you don't even care about the user on Reddit for the most part. Mm -hmm. It's it's like the the blob itself. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think what's challenging is like I don't think that the average person wants to think about that. Like in terms of like, okay, I open up an app and it's like, what what channel should I be putting this in, or what subreddit mm -hmm. should I be putting this in? Mm -hmm. And and they got so close potentially with hashtags, 
But yeah. then they like a hashtags became this super cringe thing because you could put like a bunch of them in it and it turned mm -hmm. into this like very low status spammy type behavior. Yeah. And then it, it was like almost like um, pre page rank, uh, like keyword stuffing that people would put at the bottom of like a web page. Yeah. Where it's like you'd put Pamela Anderson on your web page about cats, even though it didn't like because it was going to help you boost in Alta Vista yeah. or whatever. And I think that like it, it it's wild to me that they they didn't invent it. Chris Messina did on the platform, but like the the, the home of the hashtag was mm -hmm. never able to actually kind of like solve the spam problem with that to a yeah. way where it, whether it was hiding it in the UI or something like that, where you got one hashtag and then that was going to show the intent on where it should go. Yeah. And you got maybe an algo boost for it, but then it didn't look so cringy. And yeah. then all of a sudden you could actually create these multiple worlds where maybe if all you care about is the NBA and you just mm -hmm. say, just show me NBA tweets, Twitter mm -hmm. is now this amazing product for you because it's just this stream of NBA writers right. and athletes and memes and all that other kind of stuff. And so I, I think it was like a, a, a huge missed opportunity in the 15 years pre-Elon, and maybe Elon will solve for this, that yeah. hashtags never actually realized their full potential and instead became a low status thing on the network. Yeah, it's the eternal problem of the cost of, you know, categorizing things more precisely has always sort of been so high that ultimately we settle for just the ease of just tweeting whatever we want and then hoping that people just find the right conversation somehow. This is why to me, it, it will be interesting to see if with AI and large language models, eventually we have a better automated way where the cost is low enough that that kind of sorting can happen at scale. Uh, clearly right now, it's not there yet. Um, but if it did, I think it would vastly change the way you would build a social media company. Um, that's why that's, that's been a very fascinating thing for me to follow because that might be the one thing that significantly alters the algorithmic feed and the way you design it and, and what UIs are possible. Um, and I did notice that on Farcaster, you had started to tease out the different channels. And um, like, you know, if I were to just design uh, something, let's say you, you wanted to dominate just uh, live events like sports, award shows, and things like that, that conversation, could you just solve that problem and make those easier to find for something like Twitter? You, you probably could, but yeah, you'd have to question whether that investment of time was, was worth it. Um, but with large language models, if you had a generic solution to solve that across every <laughs> category, maybe, maybe there's something to it. Um, but yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Dan, it's, it's tricky because I feel like Twitter is stuck at all sorts of these local maximums <laughs> where you're like, yes, maybe you can make this thing better or that thing better, but is it worth it to try? Is the, is it worth it to try to invest that much? And do you lose something? Um, like, like maybe Twitter just is meant to be this local maximum forever where we all just kind of like it just the way it is. And we're fine with it like that. And the people who aren't will never use it. And so it's, it will forever be capped at roughly whatever number of MAUs it's at now. Hey, we'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everybody, if you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll wanna know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your business needs. Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offered today. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with our promo code at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm. netsuite.com slash zen. Going back to our threads conversation for, for a second, I, I wonder if a better comp for threads is not Twitter, but actually LinkedIn um, feed. Like uh, just zooming out, like where's the place if you want to post to your friends or weak ties, um, you know, announcements, updates, things that are things that are 
you're like that are happening for you, but you don't want any negativity. Um, and, and yeah, you don't want like, um, strangers. It used to be newsfeed, but I, I haven't posted newsfeed in a couple of years on, or on, on my wall. Um, I don't, I don't know if you guys do. And I wonder if threads is trying to like get, get, get into that space. I'm, I'm curious how you, uh, how you think about like the LinkedIn, you know, it's going to be a lot of cringe, but there's no politics on LinkedIn, right? Like people aren't, um, like fighting it out on LinkedIn and yet it's a huge social network we don't talk about. Yeah, I don't know. I don't use LinkedIn heavily, so I don't feel like I'm super confident in any of my opinions there. I, I think the only thing that about LinkedIn that was interesting to me is that they simulated something that kind of TikTok's algorithm had created, which was the ability to get um, massive distribution um, without having any followers. But the way LinkedIn did it, I think, was their editors would hand boost certain posts. And, you know, I know, I know plenty of friends who have said they've posted random things to LinkedIn, like some link to some piece they've written and just gotten hand boosted. And it's unbelievable the number of views you can get without a lot of followers on LinkedIn. That was always TikTok's like the most interesting thing when TikTok came along was you could have zero followers and have some TikTok go ultra viral. And in the era of Facebook and Twitter and everything, you know, you were somewhat gated by your, your own um, followers and, and what size of following you had as to how viral you could go. I mean, it was possible to have like a super viral tweet without a lot of followers, but it wasn't easy. TikTok was like, hey, we actually don't care if you have any followers. So, but I don't know. I don't know if any of you use LinkedIn a lot. It can explain it to me more. I was a LinkedIn skeptic myself. I scroll LinkedIn and I want to go and become a communist. I just get so offended <laughs> at like the capitalist driving and all this bullshit. I literally just want to don a beret and go into the hills with a machine gun. Uh, and, and, but um, it, it turns out it's actually pretty popular. We have somebody at my company assigned who owns the Spindle LinkedIn account who just like mix on. I can't bring myself to actually do it. And I, I occasionally do scroll it. And I think part of the reason why it's so polite is everyone's out there and they're like Sunday best trying to be, you know, a proud servant of capitalism and gunning for the next job or gunning for influence or, or their next round or whatever the hell it is. No one's going to like go totally rogue because that's just not the vibe of, of the sort of pageant, the parade of capitalism that is LinkedIn. But I, it, it does get a huge, a hu and it's super fucking cringe to be clear. Like mm. former founders at companies I've worked at, you know, taking time off. Obviously, they either got booted or left or got bored or whatever. And like talking about what they learned on their voyage towards whatever. It's just, <laughs> but I don't know. They get a huge amounts of engagement and comments. Like I, you can't dismiss it if that really is. And, and I guess the other thing is like nothing's really replaced the professional network, at least for mm -hmm. the techie strivers, right? Like there's, if not LinkedIn, then, then what, right? And there's like mm -hmm. literally nothing. Although that said, I mean, speaking of business models, getting back to Twitter for one second, one thing you mentioned in, in your piece, Eugene, it's funny, you're much more of a Twitter bull, I feel, in the piece than you are in this interview. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you made so, so many friends on Twitter. And, and in fact, in just in a group chat that we're in recently, um, somebody mentioned that they have DMs open. In fact, I think Elon just changed it such that DMs are not default open. And yeah. someone said, oh, no, 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 you have to keep those open because there's so much great inbound there. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of crap, but if you filter mm -hmm. it, and there's amazing inbound, and it's true, there is amazing inbound. And I think there's people who've raised funds, raised venture, like done all sorts of things just based on their Twitter status. I think LinkedIn yeah. is more the, the everyman's slightly, like, to be blunt, less interesting version of that. If you can't quite get a viral tweet going, then I guess LinkedIn will have to do. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I, I think for a certain set of people, Twitter actually is the LinkedIn. But you have to have, I mean, look, to be anybody in Silicon Valley these days, what do you have to have? A startup? a rolling fund, an actual hacker space, and a 100K plus, you know, follower account. If not, you're not on the map, right? So that, that's the place for Twitter. But if, you know, you're like marketing lead for random company X, you're on LinkedIn and pursuing the same goals, but in a very different context, I think. That, that to me is kind of yeah. what, what LinkedIn is. Link it's like the business influencer minor leagues. Hmm. Yeah, LinkedIn is I, true. I, it's true. I 100% agree. The, yeah. the professional social network for Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and, and the rest of kind of the, the knowledge economy at least, is Twitter, but mm -hmm. you have to have 10,000 followers or greater. Mm -hmm. If you're yeah. lower than that, like LinkedIn is much more, or, or you're still trying to build your, your cred and, and get there. But yeah. the other thing I, I suspect with LinkedIn's feed, and I don't have any inside knowledge on this, 
is one, if you think about the average person who's using LinkedIn, you could probably get up to 500 connections over 10 years, like pretty easy, right? You like, you mm -hmm. connect people, you meet at your office and, and over mm -hmm. time you go to a conference and you're, you proliferate your, your total number of connections. If you do post on LinkedIn, I can almost certainly, uh, guarantee that the, um, feed is friend weighted. Right. So mm -hmm. your, your friend network, if you're connected, you see that post and, and naturally if someone's saying, Hey, I had a baby or like, you know, I got promoted, it's yeah. really easy to just click like. And yeah. so for that individual, the, the dopamine of potentially having a hundred people like something that would never yeah. happen for them on Twitter, right? Like to get a hundred likes on Twitter is actually, especially with the algorithm is actually quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that it like naturally appeals to someone who they're not a word sell they don't have the audience yet on Twitter, which as soon as you cross 10,000 followers, I actually think it gets way easier to get more followers. Like it's like it, mm -hmm. followers to get followers. And so I think that that is the, the you know, bifurcation, but like any, any kind of like sufficiently high status enough person in Silicon Valley is gonna start to have a Twitter presence yeah. or then the true power move is you just like, fuck it, I'm not even on Twitter, I never use mm -hmm. it, right? Like, like right. It, it, um, Kind of the mid Twitter account yeah. is like you're working to build that level of reputation and status. But like from right. a professional standpoint, Twitter is the only thing that matters. Yeah. Um, my own career, like I, I've never right. made any meaningful connection on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and like the only thing I use it for is to just kind of quickly see if I can get a back channel reference on a candidate. Like that, that's yeah, it. yeah. I think it's true that one reason that we underrate LinkedIn is probably because we are sort of power Twitter users with some amount of following and. I, I can't remember back to a time when I was much more junior in my career, but probably there are many people for whom if they didn't have a LinkedIn account, they would be invisible to the entire professional world. And you need to just have a LinkedIn account so a recruiter can just know that you exist and look you up. And LinkedIn is really great for recruiters. It makes their job a lot easier. And then for a certain type of person who's just setting out on their career, you have to be legible to the capitalist recruiting like apparatus or you know you're forever limited and i think we we forget how just weird it was in the pre-linkedin world to try to <laughs> just be available to certain jobs like nobody could find you nobody even knew you existed uh, you had to go out and write cover letters and and all that type of crap and uh, with linkedin you just get a lot more inbound so a simpler and maybe more cynical take on the twitter threads um sort of discussion is that you're, there are people for whom their engagement has tanked on Twitter and there mm -hmm. are people for whom it stayed the same or maybe even, mm -hmm. you know, uh, grown. And if it stayed the same or grown, you're more likely to still like Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it's tanked, you're more likely to dislike it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think about, or, you know, what led to certain people's engagement changing. Elon certainly accelerated a trend that was maybe already happening. The, the vibes yeah. changed, whatever it is. And so if your engagement has tanked, and that's separate from your point earlier, Eugene, about, hey, just yeah. wanting to see friends and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. if your engagement is tanked, you know, you're going hard on threads like your professional life depends on it because it kind of does. Um, yeah. And so maybe yeah. that's, that's one way of looking at it. Honestly, I think a lot of my issues with like new Twitter would go away if they just brought back the ranked following feed. I, I don't know that that's that costly for them to do. I, I felt like it reached a, a pretty good place with that. So, you know, I follow the three of you and I would just more easily see your tweets on a regular basis or tweets from people I follow. Um, I think the way that people have talked about it a lot is as if it's very zero sum, it's like, oh, Elon brought back a bunch of more, you know, conservatives that were censored in the previous regime. And that drove away a bunch of, you know, the woke people or, or whatnot. And that debate to me makes it seem as if Twitter can only be <laughs> ever for one side or the other. And I think if you run, if you run Twitter and you want it to be still uh, some sort of public town square, um, you have to try to solve for a more positive sum version of it. Um, like, I don't think it has to be so binary, um, but maybe that's just me. Um, I, I do sense there's, there's a way in which, you know, Elon can't help himself with some of that. Um, and that like, he's fighting his own impulses on how big he wants Twitter to be, because every time he inserts himself a lot, 
it drives some people away and brings some people on. And um, I don't know. I think when we had the ranked following feed, there there was just enough balance that people would get annoyed with uh, people they they were disagreeing with, but they largely all stuck around. Um, and you know, I follow all these people, and the fact that I just don't see as much from them, or it's much harder to just makes that community feel more distant in a way. Um, that seems like a false trade-off in my opinion. The easiest thing he could do is, is to go back on his API policies. Mm -hmm. And you, if you were a tweet bot user, right? Mm -hmm. Think about that. You've, you've, you've done all the power user stuff that we've done. And then you're even more of a power user that you probably have all these like weird knobs and, and kind of mute words and lists and all the stuff that was this kind of weird niche client. Mm -hmm. But you're John Gruber, or you're, you're one of these people that actually has a massive following and, and is massive amount of like net positive, positive liquidity to Twitter mm -hmm. and like allowing the power users to actually just say, Hey, I I'll pay $20 a month. Just let me get my exact experience that I want. Mm -hmm. That's like, you're going to pay for that uh, all the time. Maybe, maybe you even have the ability to turn off your blue check because you don't want to signal you're mm -hmm. part of the new regime. Right. But mm -hmm. like the, the, Point is that the eight dollars a month that people mm -hmm. are paying, I'm paying because I kind of want to see what the, the feature yeah. set that he got. None of it actually matters to me. What I want, and I'd pay more, is 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 the control over what I see, right? Because mm -hmm. I like I'm addicted to this product. I have been for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you making it harder for me to get exactly what I want to see? Because if I see what I see, like what I want to see, I'm going to be more likely to tweet, and that. Tweeting on average, if you have a big following, probably means you're adding more good liquidity to the overall system. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting with a lot of the moves they've made. There's a sense in which even the way they talk about like, you know, their API policy changes and everything is as if they've been the platform that's been taken advantage of um, by outsiders who are like, you know, stealing out of their pocket. And to your point, Dan, it, it's true that like all social networks that scale to some degree depend on some form of subsidy from their community, um, whether it's people just writing a lot of tweets for free and trying to like, you know, um, do that or developers who are trying to build alternative interfaces and everything. And I think you do have to see it more positive some as, a, as in like, you know, they, they were contributing to the community at large. They weren't trying to steal from it necessarily. That's just like the way it might appear as an outsider coming in, um, but that you want to keep the tent big enough um, so that those people keep subsidizing your platform. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been uh, tough to see a lot of them being driven away, like a lot of the developers, the tweet bots and things like that. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I think that the other thing is, you know, $8 a month doesn't seem to be working. And what I think it should be is don't emphasize the subscription unless you want the full power feature set. But then when I pay you, you give me exactly what I want. And then I'm going to be happy because mm -hmm. all of the stuff that I don't want to see, I can kind of filter that away. I'm willing to actually do the work on the knobs, bells and whistles. Yeah. And, and then I'm probably going to tweet more. And so I, I think that that's an easy one to do because it's not even like they have to rebuild anything. It's just like they, they've already had this and it's just Twitter has slowly removed this functionality over the last 10 years mm -hmm. in a kind of futile attempt to, to monetize like Facebook, right? And, mm -hmm. and the reality is I, I think they should be monetizing much more like a newspaper, but like you, you need to actually provide the power users the features that they want. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't think I know anyone who's like, oh, the $8 a month that I'm paying for my blue check right now um, a, I don't think people want the blue check for $8 a month. What they want mm -hmm. is I want to pay Twitter some amount per month and get a better user experience. And it, it you know, undo tweet is not, it's not worth $8 a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, we have enough data, like the $8 a month thing has been around long enough. We've seen the adoption rate. That curve's not going to bend like a lot in one way or the other. And I, I do think it's worth rethinking at this point. Um, because obviously it's not going to solve all their financial problems. Um, so yeah, they tried. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that one other thing that I've kind of come around a little bit on, I mean, part of me mm -hmm. is like, I thought it was really funny because, um, had some very French revolution vibes, uh, in terms of Elon comes in, says, okay, we're getting rid of all the old blue checks. 
And yeah. like that, that, that policy just, it like objectively has not worked, right? Like mm-hmm. basically mm-hmm. you didn't actually get, I, I would have told you that more people would have paid for it because mm-hmm. I think that they would have said, okay, I want my distribution and I don't want to lose it. Yeah. Um, I think it got too political and it too, too emotional in the sense that like rocket man bad. So therefore I'm going to actually make a point that I'm not paying for. And so he's had to give the blue checks back to people, even if they aren't. So it's even more muddled, mm-hmm. but I think like the, the, in retrospect, I actually think taking that away was probably the, the single worst thing, um, that he's done in terms of the, the group of people to engage. And I think just trying to solve the bot problem and the monetization problem while taking away your kind of elite class of Twitter posters status mm-hmm. symbol is in retrospect, it, it did not work well. And I think they could have solved it with a different thing, right? Like keep the blue checks for the whatever legacy aristocracy and then add a, I don't know, a purple check or a green check for something that's not a bot. Um, or, or even better is like you basically put another symbol against someone who's not paying for some subscription uh, to indicate that they are potentially a bot or they're unverified or something like that. So, so mm-hmm. you leave the checks actually for the, the, the special people. And so I think that, that that in retrospect was a pretty costly decision. Maybe he can go back on it and it'll be fine. Um, but I think he did alienate like the full aristocracy of the network. And, and something I think a lot about in your status as a service essay is um, that is the group of people that are most invested in your network or the people who basically built their status off of the growth of your network. And so mm-hmm. to, to alienate them in the new regime, um, it's a pretty bold move and, and you better have a new aristocracy that you can swap, swap them in with. But I don't, I don't necessarily think we've hit that. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why my camera went out. Um, I'll try to get it back, but yeah, I I think the stated logic around his move to democratize the blue check for everybody. I mean, you know, on paper, it makes a lot of sense to make it just like a, you know, in the previous version, nobody knew why they were getting blue checks. And so there was this weird opacity, that whole process and created this arbitrary status marker, but it's odd that in trying to make it more democratic and open, it became even more politicized about how people got blue checks, which was just ironic. It's interesting, Dan, you mentioned, you know, earlier that Elon's optimizing for, for user seconds and, and, you know, it's a fair pushback to say, Hey, maybe you should optimize for, you know, smaller group ties or repeat usage. We were actually having a debate on this in the group chat last night because an alternative is actually, Hey, maybe you just optimize for what Twitter has had product market fit for the last you know decade, which is the battle royale strategy. Uh, just, you know, maximum chaos, uh, mayhem. Uh, but, but the problem with that is that, you know, if Twitter makes a lot of its money on communities like movies, Twitter, on NBA, Twitter, stuff like that, do you, do you risk losing those to something like a threads and just the battle royale, um, takes over the, the whole site? Um, where, where do you have the information that they make most of their money on NBA, Twitter and movies, Twitter? Uh, Shreer <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'd be actually curious, like, do, do those communities monetize better? Like, do, like, do they get better advertising for those interests? Um, my, my sense is that Twitter's just been really poorly monetized in its entire history. So I, I don't, I think like overfitting on what they've done in the past versus, I think a version of Elon coming in, maybe being a little bit more down the middle and just not pissing off the other side of the political spectrum gets you to a place where it, probably grows just from, and, and you clean out some of the, the stables, like Augie and stable style and okay, fine. So it's the same service. You added a few more people back. You didn't make it overtly political one way or another. Uh, you solved the spam problem, but you don't blow away the blue checks. Probably doesn't have a 50% decline in advertising revenue and is you know closer to profitability. That said, I, I think like, it seems like a pretty solvable problem for him. But to Eugene's point, it may just be that Twitter is never going to be Twitter of you know the year of COVID where everyone's at home, everyone's online. It is the only place people are kind of engaging with each other from a kind of public intellectual sphere standpoint. And we're moving into a world of fragmentation, right? Like you're gonna have a left-leaning set of Twitters, right-leaning set of Twitters. You'll have Twitter, probably the biggest from a distribution standpoint and the most intellectuals, but we're never gonna recreate that, that magic of like this had everybody from every political persuasion on it because there were no real alternatives and everyone was fine with kind of like the stasis from the existing regime.
I, I just think it'll be funny one day if, if that was the, the peak of Twitter and, and that time when we were all in it together, just how will we even describe it to people who weren't there <laughs> for it and what it felt like? Um, and to Antonio's point, like um, Twitter might be upstream of everything, but if, uh, if it doesn't grow in, in user base um, and it's not palatable to advertisers, like it, it feels like it's destined to be a relative failure of an acquisition from a financial perspective. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think very soon, right? Like if if they had just done diligence before the acquisition, <laughs> so much of this could have been avoided. Um, and, and, you know, I think Elon and team signaled really quickly by how hard they fought against it, that they knew it was a huge overpay. Um, but again, that's a sunk cost now. Like we can't, <laughs> we can't salvage that. So maybe it's best not to think about trying totally. to make that price back and just make Twitter the best of whatever it can be. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I think Dan's probably right in that, you know, so many people have left and, and made it such a big thing to have left that, you know, they probably aren't coming back. And so, um, yeah, we probably aren't getting the peak pandemic Twitter thing ever back when we were all just stuck on here and, that's how we kind of kept in touch with each other um, for a particular set of us. Um, even, you know, even as people have fled to other things, just trying other Twitter alternatives, it's, it's so odd to just see the fragments of people that have landed in like one place or the other. It's kind of like the planet exploded and we all landed on different planets. And <laughs> it's just hard to, I think it's impossible to put it back together. It's kind of a one way, one way form of entropy. Yeah, I, I, I think of it as like um, fall of the Roman Empire, right? You still have Byzantium, Constantinople, Eastern Roman Empire. For another thousand years, it slowly declines, but it's still the most powerful and influential mm -hmm. thing in that new ecosystem. But then you have, you know, Gaul turns into France and Iberia mm -hmm. gets conquered by the kind of Islamic Caliphate. And like, you just, you're going to have your own set of new things. Yeah. Um, and so for maybe for the rest of our lives, effectively, we're still going to have Twitter as this huge thing, Yeah. but it, it's just kind of the, the, the monopoly on the kind of like public intellectual town square of the internet that is no mm -hmm. longer there. They're just a, mm -hmm. a, a huge player. Within it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we, we talked about this last week with, uh, Mike Solana. I, I think the, the absolutely dumbest thing that they've done thus far, and there've been a bunch of questionable decisions, um, is this the, the war on Substack? It's mm -hmm. like the overlap of people who are like really into their Substack and like, you know, using Twitter as the way they're doing the comment section. Like mm -hmm. that was a perfect symbiotic relationship. It was like the alligator or the crocodile with the little bird that like cleans the teeth. It's just mm -hmm. like, let that, that be. And the fact that like th there was kind of this, okay, we're going to downrank links uh, in the feed and even more so on Substack and we're going to block this. Is just it it it's unnecessary violence to the power set of creators. Like if you have a Substack, Eugene, you have one, mm -hmm. but like yeah. you you are driving the intellectual conversation. You are upstream of what is happening on Twitter, and that that the the missive that happens on Substack feeds into the the Twitter sphere, which then propagates out to the rest of media. And mm -hmm. and so keeping that relationship in a good place. Uh, and actually having some neutrality between the newsletter platform and, and the kind of social media distribution platform, I actually think was a, that was a very good uh, equilibrium that, that unnecessarily got mucked with. Yeah. It again relates to the thing we were talking about earlier, where they keep talking about all these things like Substack as if they're stealing from Twitter in some way, when they should be viewing it as, wow, it's great that all these other places still turn to Twitter as like the best way for them to plug into a certain type of, you know, public conversation. And the more they alienate those and shut those out, the more they drive, the more they force people to find alternative forms of distribution for themselves. Because everybody who writes and talks online, like, they're trying to find an audience in one way or the other. Um, this also, you know, the talk about Twitter, you know, and, and, you know, I think I wrote in my piece that Twitter's not going away. Like, I'm pretty sure there won't be an exact replacement for it. And 
it fits a pattern I've seen a lot with uh, early internet giants. Like at some point, I felt like Google search results started getting worse for me, uh, but I still use Google. And it's the same for Amazon. Like Amazon search results started getting worse for me, uh, but I've still used Amazon for years. Um, these platforms have such, you know, just, just being the site of first resort for so many people is so hard to displace. And to come up with an alternative to these companies that have just massive uh, market share is tricky. So they can afford to decline and still retain most of their audience for many, many years. You know, I can't remember the last time I thought that Google search results got better for me. It's been years since that's happened, and it's just gradually I feel like it's worse and worse. But I haven't really found uh, a great alternative. What I was saying before about the fall of the Roman Empire, it's just this kind of slow, gradual decline, not a sudden collapse. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, the Foundation series supposedly is back, and I refuse to watch it because the first, it's my favorite trilogy of all time, I've read it like 10 times. And <laughs> the first season was so god awful bad. Outside of the non source material, brother, you know, day, dusk, dawn, empire sitch, I don't know if you watched it. Like, and so, but it, it's yeah. on my mind in terms of the, I, I think the Roman Empire is, is a pretty good uh, mm -hmm. analogy for not only Twitter, but just like even that era of the internet that we just went through in the mm -hmm. last 10 years. And I think in a post kind of anti big tech, FTC, can't acquire things. S curve on mobile has ended. Um, you know the power of these kind of like big incumbents. Now that with AI coming out, it's like pretty quickly looking like okay, there's actually not going to be that much disruptive innovation. It's a sustaining innovation for the big guys. Yeah, is it, the analogy I also think about from a business standpoint is like kind of like post war America. Like everything went towards this like big corporate food. And like, you know, corporate America was going to be providing you with TV dinners and all this other kind of stuff. And then you naturally had a backlash against that to say, actually, there, there, there's a bunch of high fructose corn syrup and all this crap. Like, it, this is not healthy. Food pyramid is a scam. And you naturally get this kind of counterculture that becomes organic food and, and whole foods, which itself is now corporate. But um, I think it's a very different mode of, of how we... Uh, connect as consumers with food in the U.S., right? And average European is going to look at you and go, like, we never changed how we interacted with food. But I think for mm -hmm. uh, the average American, food is actually a far more diverse landscape now and, and I think higher quality on average for the average American, maybe a little bit more expensive. And I suspect we probably are going to see the same thing happen on the Internet where you're going to have these giants, to your point, Google, mm -hmm. Amazon, social media, where they've kind of naturally declined because... They've kind of reached the ends of the earth in terms of like Facebook has 3 billion DAO. Like they, mm -hmm. they literally either need to create more people or, or I don't know, like they, they've run out of people to, mm -hmm. to sign up for their services. And so I, I actually think it now that you've gotten everyone on the top of the S curve in terms of penetration, mm -hmm. to use the Ben Thompson version of the world, these niches can actually be huge, right? You can mm -hmm. find a million person social network niche. And with all of the, the kind of improvements in developer productivity and such, you might be able to run that as more of a lifestyle or non-venture backed business. And it actually just generates a bunch of cash and it's like an amazing experience because you're not uh, on the hamster wheel of, of perpetual growth from the, the prior inter, era, you know, zero interest rate plus mobile S curve. Yeah, in general, I think it's, I mean, it's challenging even for me to think now about like venture scale backed success stories in the past however many years um and to and to your point maybe that's just a structural thing where we have these huge incumbents and you know venture companies chasing after the next version of that is just like a, a fool's errand um and that many more of these companies should consider alternative sources of funding because just structurally i mean if you just invested in a basket of the incumbents <laughs> just public stocks uh, for the past however many years. I mean, it's just like, it's been unbelievable returns. Um, and now, you know, I see companies across my desk that are raising from angels and they're trying to raise a seed round. And, you know, you look everywhere, it's just hard to see venture scale markets in, in what they're trying to do. Um, and it, it is a challenge. And maybe this was just a natural thing that was going to happen because of the nature of increasing returns on the internet. And the fact that, you know, it's funny with the FTC because 
in some ways, there, there's just this general sentiment on their part that big is bad. And, you know, probably for those of us trying to build startups and things like that, we, we probably agree on that point that, you know, the incumbents aren't going to be the sources of innovation and a lot of talent goes there to die. And um, it would be more interesting if there were more um, competition for them. But maybe the FTC is just like, first of all, it's like, it's unclear what, like, it's not clear to me what their um, alternative is to the consumer harm standard of antitrust when it comes to tech. Like they, they haven't really articulated one that makes sense. And second, maybe it's just too late generally. Like <laughs> they're trying to close the barn doors and it's like everything already got out. Um, and so I, I don't know. Um, I, I think there's an alternative to this, like this theory of consumer harm, which is just that this general feeling I have that if the big companies hoover up all the talent but can't come up with like, just because they're too bureaucratic, they can't come up with new ideas that we, we lose out as a community on a type of innovation that just can't happen <laughs> anymore or won't, won't happen there. But it's hard to build a, a legal standard around that type of counterfactual. <laughs> I feel it, but I don't know how to like, uh, put my finger on it. Uh, I don't know if you, if you guys feel that, um, this is my biggest issue. I, I'm sympathetic to the anti-big tech, like especially when you know I want to be able to release different features yeah. in my app, and Apple doesn't right. allow me. Like yeah. that turns me into the kind of like yeah. take you know take down this wall. Yeah. But at the same time, I love my iPhone, mm -hmm. and in a world where the government comes in and tries to muck with the App Store and says, okay, now we have competing App Stores, you know that all of these major apps are going to, you know, Meta, they're going to release their own app store. It's going to have their own set of privacy policies. There's going to be now, we're going to get back to like antivirus stuff, right? Like I'm going to have to go fix my mom's iPhone because, you know, she, she downloaded some app that her friend mm -hmm. told her to download and, and then she got malware. And so I, I, I am very conflicted on it. I yeah. think it's an extremely hard problem. I haven't seen a good proposed solution. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I also think like the, I noticed you were on that app. Um, what's the new hot uh, social uh, photo sharing app? Retro. Retro. Mm. Beautiful app. Ex mm -hmm. Instagram folks yeah. like. I think they just raised around. Mm -hmm. You know, very buzzy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, every detail is just just perfect, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, I just look at that and I go, is if this gets any amount of traction, it, you know that both Snap and Instagram and like all, all of the photo sharing platforms effectively will have the the mm -hmm. set of features, right? In the same mm -hmm. way that like I think TikTok and Snap both copied, and I, I want to even say Instagram did it, like with Be Real. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just it's it's really challenging because I think when a lot of those other apps, even Instagram or sorry Snapchat, and I think TikTok is a really interesting. Uh, anomaly here because they came so late in the game and I mm -hmm. think maybe that's just they spent a ton of money on advertising to like bootstrap that user base yeah. but I think Snap feels like the last social app that was able to kind of like hit escape velocity and arguably their best feature got cloned by, by Instagram and then they, they're they now in theory subscale right they're, instead yeah. of being a hundred billion dollar company they're only a twenty billion right. dollar company but, it, yeah. but basically the, the mapping for the last five to ten years almost is that you actually can't scale a social app based on a novel mechanic be unless you have a billion dollars to spend like ByteDance because mm -hmm. the incumbents already have the distribution are just going to clone your, your feature. And mm -hmm. so I actually think in a, in a certain way, you're kind of stuck with these big players with potentially the exception now of Twitter because of a set of decisions policy-wise and mm -hmm. vibe-wise that is now at least having people be open to, okay, well, I'm, if I can't get back to the Twitter of, of COVID 2020, mm -hmm. I might be in the market for a new kind of like text-based social community that I might be a little less scale, but uh, it, it better suits my needs. Yeah. It's certainly in social, it's very tough because in the West, we've just ended up with a bunch of privatized social graphs. And so it's hard to challenge the incumbents when they have such scale uh, in their graphs. And that argues for some sort of, you know, antitrust policy around more graph portability or something like that, 
downstream, which maybe gives smaller companies a, a bit of a chance. You know, just just trying to recreate my Twitter graph on threads and things like that. You realize just how brutal a process that is. Um, and you know, it's understandable <laughs> why the incumbents don't want people to be able to take their graph. In fact, we, we maybe will look back on that period of um, Facebook Connect or you know, when Twitter had their graph open and Instagram just like grabbed it um, as this like crazy period where a bunch of ad <laughs> subsidized networks let other people copy their graph. And they obviously have like learned from that mistake and, and quickly shut that down. Um, but I don't know. I probably, I don't know how you feel about it, Dan, because you, you have your own um, kind of social network that you're running now. Like, how do you feel about graph portability as a, as like a legal policy? Well, I think one of the foundational components of, of Farcaster is, is the portability of the graph. But what, what's really interesting is we've already gamed it out in that we know that if, if let's say some app on the Farcaster protocol mm -hmm. really takes off, like, mm -hmm. you know, hits escape velocity. Mm -hmm. um, outside of us, like the, the core team, like where we, we have committed to making it work with the protocol and, and your natural inclination as the app is to say, why would I contribute the, any information back out outside of distribution, which, you know, boosts like counts and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The social graph, like I want that as a proprietary thing. And so mm -hmm. assuming you're building on an pro open protocol, and, and this is actually something that I think the Fediverse is going to have a hard reality with Facebook on is mm -hmm. if you're the, the dominant set of distribution for a graph, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you just won't publish it back to the network. You'll say, hey, I'll publish the content to the network. That's fine, right? Because that mm -hmm. increases the visibility of the content, which further gets people to use the app. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to let you take the graph. The graph is like, that's really important. So I suspect mm -hmm. what's going to happen with, with Facebook, with the Fediverse mm -hmm. and Mastodon, mm -hmm. is they won't allow you to index the, the, the threads graph. Because the threads mm -hmm. graph is going to be very close to Instagram. So that's effectively a backdoor way into getting a lot of Instagram graph. Uh, information. And so what they're going to do is, I, I suspect what it'll be is, let's say that you violate some rules on threads for being mean or, or whatever. Yeah. They're going to say, hey, you can no longer have a threads account, but you can federate back into threads via the Fediverse. So mm -hmm. Facebook will turn it into this kind of like black box where the content can come in, mm -hmm. but you can't get anything out, right? Outside of maybe a like or, or a reply. So you can have like an implied graph maybe of like who's yeah. liking your stuff. But even there, it might, they might even make it more black box. I, I am very, very skeptical that Facebook, given their entire history, is going to just suddenly take Instagram, their most valuable property, with yeah. threads and allow people to just say, oh, I, I want to see everyone who's following Kim Kardashian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to be able to map all of that and then see who they're following and then it, like construct a graph and then be able to bring it into their thing. So... I, I, yeah. I think that from an incentive standpoint, it's extremely difficult to mm -hmm. create both kind of like an open standard, right? Like whether yeah. you're building a protocol like Farcaster or AT Proto or, or sure. uh, ActivityPub, Fediverse, yeah. um, and then have any type of scaled client outside of maybe the core team that like commits to doing this. As soon as you kind of have an opportunistic client come in, they're, they're going to try to centralize the graph into their app because that's actually, that's the mm -hmm. network effect, right? Like it, it becomes right. their moat. Yeah. What do you think about the government mandating <laughs> that Facebook open up their graph or something like that? Like, what would your, what would your feeling be about something like that? So if, if the government was to mandate portability, selfishly, mm -hmm. I'd be excited, right? It's yeah. going to benefit my business. But I think from a tactical standpoint, mm -hmm. the implementation really matters. Mm -hmm. And so like, for example, if I could just pull all of my Instagram followers or my, all of my Twitter followers, what's the identifier that I'm getting? Am I just getting their username? Mm -hmm. And then now people need to like opt in on, on kind of like what yeah. username they are, or is it you're getting some like cryptographic hash that like can prove that you actually, this is your... Yeah. So I think like mandating that from a government level, I, I'm just really skeptical. And I think what you'd end up having is a bunch of regulatory capture from the big guys that yeah. would make it easy for them to pull information into their networks. But mm -hmm. for you, your, your ability to kind of like properly map mm -hmm. the network, yeah. um, I think would be quite difficult. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, um, 
I think it's yeah. op, uh, like a wishful thinking, but I think realistically, even I, I just wouldn't trust an FTC enforced mm -hmm. version of like here's graph portability or congressional law around graph portability. I mean, just look yeah. at kind of even like how phone number portability works. It mm -hmm. like kind of works, but it's a pain in the ass. No one really does yeah. it. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, I think if, if you, someone was to propose like a really simple standard that I like could understand and say, okay, actually this would really benefit where I could like kind of move between uh, social platforms. And so when Instagram decides they want to really push algorithmic reels and I really just want OG Instagram with photos, I can right. switch to a new client and it works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, that sounds great, but I, I just don't, don't see it happening. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, in trying to find people I follow on Twitter on threads, just how hard it is when you use username because people came up with weird usernames on threads. And I'm like, who are these people? And then you go in, you're like, oh, it's that person. I do know them, but you know, it's hard to tell. Um, it's funny you bring up phone number. You know, ultimately, as social apps today, you really, the only open graph you can kind of all use is phone number or email address. Um, it's asking for, per for permission on the phone to the person's contact book. So you can use phone number as a key and try to recreate something and, and not have to start from scratch. Um, but it's true that outside of those two, we don't really have any alternatives. Yeah, maybe maybe that's actually the, the answer. So I stand maybe corrected in the sense that the easiest way would just be mandated, hey, you either have a phone number or an email for every one of your users, which they all do, right? Yeah. And when someone says I want to export my graph, it just mm -hmm. list of all the people. Yeah. And here, here are all the phone numbers. Now, what gets tricky though is like on Twitter, yeah. if I follow Elon Musk, I don't have his phone number. Yeah. Right. So I don't have yeah. his email. Right. And so there's there's like a nuance in if if Facebook where it's a double opt in or LinkedIn where you kind of like both know each other, there's yeah. like an implicit assumption that you probably have some level of contact information. Yeah. Whereas in the unidirectional model, I think that gets a little bit tricky. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, 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 it, it would be, uh, I, 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 I get all the like debates over, um, centralization and decentralization. And it does feel like we, we probably are in this in for a period of more decentralization. Um, but I wonder if there aren't ways to achieve just some sort of balance between the two over time. Um, I do want a bit of the old Twitter, like everybody in, in one room, like that, that sense of community and conversation. But I also want to balance that with the group chats and other things, which are a little more deterministic. Um, and I would love to see, you know, smaller companies just have a shot because I, I do think in general, just structurally, when you, you favor these super large tech companies, that there is some tax on just future innovation. Um, I think mean, there's just some things, you know, it's hard to argue that there isn't like just, uh, an increase in bureaucracy and attacks on innovation by favoring these gigantic companies, um, that I just really aren't built for the, the types of innovation a startup's going to produce. Um, it's hard. I, I think you... All and probably I, I I also know a lot of um, super bright people that are at some tech giant and are maybe languishing a little on the vine. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. I, I, I do think the one thing that we're going to get out of this on, on a longer term, and I, like I have very strong conviction there, and, and hopefully Forecaster plays a part of that, but yeah. the, the kind of fragmentation that Elon is driving with Twitter through mm -hmm. kind of some of the policy he's doing there is creating enough of an interest, I actually think, in the decentralized protocol-based social networking space. Mm -hmm whether that again is, is now an interest in, in Mastodon and ActivityPub in the Fediverse, you have AT Proto, you have Farcaster, you have other, other decentralized social stuff. Um, I do think the infrastructure there is going to get a lot better. And I actually think from a uh, kind of entrepreneurial canvas, if I was to fast forward a few years, if I wanna actually go build a new network based on maybe a, a niche or a mm -hmm. specific interest, or frankly, just a, 
call it a digital country club, right? Like you're mm -hmm. just like, hey, I actually have an amazing network. I want to invite 10,000 ish people. You know, Discord and group chats really don't work well for that. Yeah. But a feed based kind of like Twitter model, but but invite only. And actually, one of the ideas I had before even starting Farcaster is just take a Mastodon server and don't actually federate it. Like just basically say, hey, this is an invite only Mastodon server and actually just kind of see where it would go. Because I think what one of the magical things about the timeline of Twitter and that U UX mm -hmm. is you can wake up in the morning or, or be away for a few days, you open up, boom, like you, you get the most relevant stuff in theory that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And I think what gets really stressful about a, a big group chat mm -hmm. is it, it, the UX assumes that every message is of equal information priority to you and then the mm -hmm. unread count. So you see like, you yeah. know, the 900 unread in a third yeah. group chat and you're just kind of like that meme where it's like, I'm happy for you, but yeah. I ain't reading that. Like, it's, yeah. so whereas the timeline, there is a natural feel of you can just dip in and dip out. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think the modality that we'll probably end up towards, and, and maybe we end up working on this, but I, I have this theory that it's like, take the magic of what the group chat is. It's like this mm -hmm. curated group of people that are kind of interesting with the UX on, on mobile of like, I don't need to catch up on everything because by definition, like this isn't yeah. like homework. It, it's supposed to be more entertainment with yeah. the feed. And, and if you actually can blend those two things together, I, I think then you might actually start to create a new type of experience that is specifically not focused on scale. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think I, I think maybe I put this in my piece just about, I don't know if, if you had this, but during the pandemic, I got invited to all these like discord communities. People would start some discord and be like, Hey, this is my community. And you drop in and there'd be some channel with like, you know, 500 people that you don't know and you'd quickly just turn off notifications or leave the group. And so the UI of both Discord and Slack, I think, is just really um, very narrowly useful <laughs> for a certain type of community and really ill suited to many other types of communities that it's used for. But, you know, people use Discord because it's free and um you know, they're not making any money off these communities. So that's what they go to. But yeah, that UI is very, very uh, unsuited <laughs> to that type of conversation. So I hadn't thought about the fact that, you know, kind of a ranked timeline like Twitter had was one way of solving that scalability constraint. It's just like, look, yeah, you don't have to catch up on, you know, 900 unread messages in this Slack thread. Uh, but, you know, here's a few that were important. And you can take a look at them if you want. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, the, the implementation of Slack and that type, that modality of communication in companies reminds me a little about how open floor plans were just imposed on tech companies at scale with very little testing or thought to what the consequences of that were. And both, I think, just extracted a huge cost on company productivity. Uh, but it's just the fact that tech companies are so powerful in their network effects and monopolistic characteristics that um, you didn't really notice the productivity hit. <laughs> but um, I think that cost was not insignificant. I completely agree. And we actually manage Slack pretty aggressively. We have a team of 10. Yeah. Um, we don't create new channels. So yeah. I think channel proliferation, bad for, for Slack. And I actually think keeping a small number of channels and then we actually use threads Right, everything's just a remix. But but yeah. when you post something in a channel, like in the small number of channels, it reduces the cognitive overload of where should this go. Yeah. But then the nice thing is if you don't if you don't want to actually participate in a specific kind of like, oh, yeah. let's retro this decision we made over here. If there are 76 messages in that, I only see one line with like the 76 underneath it, which approximates much more of a Twitter timeline where if I don't want to engage with that tweet with the 700 you know, replies over here and just like people are yelling at each other. Great. Like you can kind of just keep scrolling past. Um, yeah. But I, but I do think it, like the, the UI and, and just user experience of, of these social products, I think mm -hmm. people underestimate how much of that creates a, both the behaviors of the network and then B that they aren't interchangeable. I spent a lot of time talking to people about this in the sense that like, I think a, a, a lot of folks in, in crypto, because there are a lot of group chats and a lot of mm -hmm. discords, they think that is the actual optimal way of doing kind of like large group communication. Yeah. 
And then I'm like, well, where do you actually spend the most time as they spend the most time on Twitter? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, so there's a dis disconnect here. It's like, you're building a piece of software that you don't even use yourself because you're spending time on Twitter. And it's like, why do you spend time on Twitter? Twitter allows for breath. It allows for the ability to just keep scrolling, like algorithmic waiting. And so I, I, I think, um, I don't know, I'd, I'd be actually very curious to see if we end up getting a little bit more experimentation now that threads exist. And, and again, Twitter feeling a little bit more uh, open season in terms of people being able to play around with it of just like, yeah. what is a short text status update with a social graph? Like, yeah. are there other modalities that we can actually do this with, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. right now all we have really is messaging and then the kind of like Twitter experience. And it's like, there's something in between. Yeah, yeah, I, I think threads, this is where it get, gets interesting with threads. You know, uh, Facebook is very good at cloning things very quickly. Can they innovate on top of the that interface? Um, other than just borrowing things directly from Twitter, will they come up with alternative interfaces for threads that branch out? Um, I hope they do and experiment with it. I actually think they probably do have to <clears throat> do something like that, um, but I'm not sure if they can. Um, and, and yeah, I, I agree. I, I think to me, the, the entry of Slack into workplaces and just observing the effect on companies was just, it's unbelievable. It's so massive. Uh, I, when I first joined Amazon, we lived in the um, email only era of internal communications. We had emails and internal listservs. And that was it. That was like our entire communication stack for the company out, outside of like physical meetings. And, you know, I think um, Jeff always felt that, uh, hey, there's, there's problems with email um, because it, it's so like privatized and it's almost all private messages. And occasionally when he wanted to make a big point, he would do a massive CC to a huge group. He's like, I'm writing this email, but I need a lot of people to see it. Like, I don't want it to just be the people who are on this email thread. Um, so his, 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 you know, his sense was that, okay, a lot of information is not being shared enough inside the company. And then we moved fully to the opposite end of the spectrum with Slack, which is like, oh, every little thing needs to be <laughs> shown to so many people. And it was the exact op opposite problem. It's like, actually, no, you just created so much noise for every person in your company. And now can we find that like happy balance between the two? What does that look like? Um, you talked about threads uh, inside of Slack. You know, I think back to news groups in the early days of the internet, you know, all, all those forums and, you know, each thread would have its own subject line. And so you could easily ignore the ones that you weren't interested in. So I do think we have some models to build off of, like this isn't completely an unsolved problem. Um, it's the same with uh, meetings. I feel like with meetings, we've gone the opposite direction right now with like companies like Shopify and everything. There's this huge vogue in reducing meetings. It's like, hey, meetings are a waste. Um, but again, with meetings, I think there's also a balance. Like I actually think, yes, in Shopify's interface, you can see the cost of scheduling a meeting, uh, but they don't have the flip side. They don't have some measurement of the benefits of meetings. Um, we've gone so fully to remote work that in a way we've, I mean, this is a, a really weird natural experiment in how to run companies by going completely to remote work, minimizing meetings, going fully to zoom meetings. We've drastically swung to one other end of the spectrum. And I actually think there are a lot of problems with that. Like if there's something that I would say that I believe in that seems like out of fashion right now. It's that meetings do have some sort of value that's not captured. Um, so while I agree that a lot of meetings are wasteful in some ways, I think we're underrating um, some of the benefits of people gathering in space together. Um, and, and, you know, probably we'll swing back at some point when we realize that. So it's funny you mentioned that, um, you know, we're 10 people, we're all remote other than my co-founder Varun and yeah. are, are here in um, LA. So mm -hmm. we're, we're together. So we have a lot of sync time. We like sit yeah. three feet apart. Yeah. Um, but, but to try to manage the team, now we're a pretty senior team. So I actually yeah. don't think there's as much like hand, hand to hand management that needs to happen. 
That yeah. said, I think what we found with meetings, um, and I, I hate meetings, but yeah. I think that there is actually something that's really valuable in terms of compressing cycle times to your point about uh, the value that it adds to a company. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have one meeting a week as like your team meeting, then yeah. naturally things trend towards that one meeting to, for the yeah. decisions that, that wouldn't necessarily get done in an async way or ambiguities yeah. pop up. Yeah, And so what we've done is we've actually moved to a model where we, we actually have a period each day mm -hmm. that's just a sync period. So we, we actually have a standing meeting. It's, you know, stand up like this has existed. But the, the point is, is not actually for everyone to say what they're doing. It's, it's specifically to get everyone on a call so that, hey, are you running into any issues? Yeah, I actually ran into this. But now mm -hmm. everyone else is available. And so mm -hmm. people can actually kind of be working. But the expectation is, okay, great. Like, you know, Jane, Jim, like, let's, let's actually you know, break off right now and actually go solve this. But the, that, that one hour, everyone's expected to be, hey, this is a high interrupt period. And then you can mm -hmm. go back to doing whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but it actually creates a ton of um, cycle compression, which therefore increases the velocity of new feature development, which to your point about value, yes, yeah. the meeting costs money. But the whole point is, is that in theory, if you have the meeting, you get more coordinated and then you actually can deliver on the, the new product that actually generates growth, which should in theory drive, yeah. drive revenue. Yeah, you know, you know, Kos's theory of the firm, and he was always like, "Hey, why, why is it that we have companies at all? Why, why aren't we all independent contractors?" And I think he won a Nobel Prize for this, or or something to that effect. But he said it's because of coordination costs. You know, if everybody was an independent contractor, just getting certain things done, the coordination costs would be so high that firms that just like formed. And lowered those coordination costs by having people, you know, go work at an office together and whatnot would have a huge advantage. And it's funny with remote work that we kind of are testing that theory again. We're like, hey, what if everybody kind of did feel like an independent contractor again and just work from home and logged in a computer? There, there is something kind of a dystopic feeling about it. Um, I just think with remote work fits a pattern of many things that I think are dangerous in that you see the benefits immediately. Like you immediately get two hours of commute time back every day or whatnot. And you can, you know, do yoga in the morning or spend some time with your kids or you're like, oh, this is great. And, but the costs of going fully remote just aren't seen right away. You see them downstream. Um, anytime the benefits come first and the downsides come later, um, I think people are easy to uh, make a rash judgment. Um, and the thing that you're talking about, Dan, with your ability to coordinate, um, it's a classic case of what Coase would say, which is that, you know, if you can lower that coordination cost, that has a huge value to any entity, any group of people working together. Um, you know, I was just reading, uh, American Prometheus cause I wanted to try to finish it before, um, watching, uh, Oppenheimer this week. And, you know, they, they went and built this whole thing out in Los Alamos and they moved all the physicists and scientists out there to try to accelerate their timeline to making the atomic bomb. And, you know, after the project was over, everybody wanted to leave. No one wanted to be stuck there anymore. But I think it's hard to argue that, you know, against the fact that, you know, being out there together really accelerated their ability to get to... Uh, completion of that project. Um, so I don't know. I think we're um, wrapping a bunch of problems together. Like a lot of the problems of going to work in an office with other people are problems of American urban planning. Just the fact that we have to commute so far and be stuck in traffic and all of that. Um, that that's being conflated with, oh, like being in an office is unproductive. And then we're also conflating the problem of open office floor plans with not being productive at the office. Um, it's crazy because when I first went to Amazon, we looked to Microsoft for everything because they were the tech giant that everybody um, talked about back then. And they had done this huge study that said, hey, you know, developers are more productive if they have their own office and two monitors. So all their developers had an office and two monitors. And when I first joined Amazon, that's, you know, even though I wasn't a coder, I had my own office and I had a big monitor. Uh, and they had, to a, uh, they had done a bunch of tests and studies to support this decision. 
But when we went to open floor plan offices, I don't think there were any studies done on what the effect was. It was sold as being more democratic. You know, like, oh, Zuck is on the floor working with everybody else. So we're all equals, which, you know, is not true, um, but also just made everybody less productive, especially developers who are like, oh, now I can't even go to the office during the day because I can't get anything done. So I need to come to the office at like 10 at night, work through the night. Uh, when nobody's there to bother me. And at that point, yeah, you, you might as well just stay home and work from home because it's, it's, it probably is more productive. But if we made offices that were more productive for that type of solo thinking, but balance that with the ability to, you know, run into your coworkers and do kind of coordinated group thinking, um, we might go back to a, a better place. Um, I don't know. That's my opinion. I'm not sure how you guys feel about it. Oh, I'm a, I'm a huge believer, like in the effectiveness of being in an office. Um, granted I'm in an office with one other person most days, yeah. but even right. when the team is here, um, uh, we have on a, like a, an onsite every so often, like th there's just an energy that is not present when you are working by yourself. You can feel mm -hmm. other people working and mm -hmm. working hard and like solving, like you can like, it's like the heat coming out of their brain from trying to get through a tough problem. Like yeah. body language, like it, it, I definitely think has an impact on you in terms of like your motivation. And um, yeah, I, I think you're spot on in the sense that it's a downstream problem of like how our cities are designed, how real estate is too yeah. expensive. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it basically there was a lot more cheap real estate because we built up in most of these major cities and people could basically walk to work and, and right. you know, yeah, have all the uh, the accoutrements of being in a city and not having to spend the time. I think people would love that, especially younger people. I think I, I yeah. think older people with like kids like start to be like, oh, I want a little bit more space or whatever. But yeah, um, I mean, the, one of the, my favorite things about living here in Venice is I, I always say this to people: I moved to LA and I get in a car less than I did in SF because mm -hmm. I live in Venice. I yeah. walk to my office. Yeah, I never get in a car. It's it's unbelievable. Like it, yeah. it's such an amazing thing. But I don't work from home. I would go crazy working. Yeah. Um, in terms of just, I think that the separation of like your work self with your home self is, is, is useful. So I don't know. I, I, I think, um, the, the, the whole thing that's going to change this in my opinion though, is this, if this vision pro, which I, I like how it was <laughs> like a hot second, like that was the dominant thing in yeah. tech. I feel like our cycle times on just like, what is the thing mm -hmm. like, and now no one's talking about it. And granted it's coming out next year, but yeah. If, if the iteration happens the way I think it's going to happen, I think that the fidelity of those experiences is going to significantly improve. And I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to solve for everything about not being in an office, but I definitely think it'll increase the uh, connectedness of people when they're working remote, especially if you get to a place where you could wear the thing all day. Like there is almost like some ambient presence. We, we got some weird approximations uh, of this type of feeling. I, I don't know if you used any of these like presence tools during the pandemic, but like one of them for <laughs> uh -huh. us was, um, uh, damn it. I forget the name of it. It was, it was, it was really good. And then okay. they just weren't able to scale it, but basically yeah. think of it as like aim style. Like you had the presence of the people on the team. They were like one click to be able to hop into a call. Yeah. Uh, so somewhat like what Slack has done with huddles, yeah. but, but it was amazing because you could kind of see uh, it would show what work app someone was using. So it approximated a little bit of like, yeah. oh, they're in a spreadsheet. I probably don't want to go tap them on the shoulder or whatever. Right. And I do think that the the fidelity of that experience, if applied to something where that people were in my peripheral vision while I'm wearing yeah. some type of like augmented headset. Yeah. I, I can see it like getting better towards being in an office without necessarily having to be there. But I, even then, I still think that there is something magical about having to even if it's just a small amount of time get out of your house yeah. put on some clothes in a way that's like i'm going to present myself to the world and and like it doesn't have to be a far commute but just a little bit of a commute i actually do think creates a little bit of separation between work and, and home i think it's under um rated to what degree this vast shift to remote work is one of the craziest like natural experiments in, in changing a society that has ever been conducted. Um, we, you know, I, I, I study social capital like things a lot and I'm very interested in that topic. And 
you know, it's long been commented that in America, we've had this decline in social capital because we no longer have third places. People don't go to church as much and they don't have these like, you know, things in general. Urban planning is, is a huge contributor to that problem in America. One of the last things that people uh, were forced to do to gather in person was go to the office. And then the pandemic came along and just knocked out that last thing. And so the huge shift in how much time people spent by themselves <laughs> during the pandemic was exacerbated by remote work and, you know, understandable, like totally understandable why in a pandemic that that all happened. But um, it's not surprising to me that we see all sorts of issues um, in society that that I think emanate from that that thing. And yeah, the thing that you were saying, Dan, the, like an underrated part is even just putting on an outfit to go to the office, that ritual itself, how it shifts your mindset and how going to an office together where everybody is also doing that, like putting on an outfit and going to be a professional self in that space was a kind of communal ritual that we just suddenly threw out. And um, yeah, we see an epidemic of loneliness and young workers who are depressed and Lots of things. Uh, obviously, it is different for people who are more experienced in their career, who already have that social capital built up with their coworkers or peers. Uh, but if you're just starting out in your career, I think it's just crazy how bad remote work is for, for your career in any number of ways. Not just being able to model yourself after people that are more experienced than you, that you can be around in the office. Um, and understand what it means to be, you know, like a professional and, and you know, to be good at running teams and everything. Um, not being able to meet other coworkers the same age as you at the office. Um, a lot of, you know, we, uh, a lot of people right now are talking about San Francisco's problems. Um, I think a huge percentage of those problems would be solved just by people in tech having to go back to the office and bringing that flow of people back through the city. Um, that's probably the biggest, the single biggest thing tech right now could do for San Francisco. But obviously it's difficult. You know, people have gotten used to remote work and some amount of people love it. And it's a negotiation right now. But it's not surprising to me that even companies that focus on remote work tools are trying to get their employees back in the office. That's a big tell. Yeah, I, I, I think the... If I was young in my career now working remote, oh, I, I, I think it's the worst thing that could possibly happen because I think so much of what you learn in your kind of first part of your career is through osmosis. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get that through a Zoom call. Yeah. Like it just, you get, you're getting like a literally a flattened version yeah. of the other person. Yeah. And, and oh, well, we meet up once a, once a quarter for, basically a mini vac work vacation yeah, is, is right. not not going to replicate yeah um yeah I, I like i i think it it is a travesty i think one of the things we have made conscious decision being remote is we we're only hiring like l7 type engineers yeah. or above right and when we shift at some point we hit some yeah. amount of growth and, and like the company yeah. needs like way more people yeah. Every junior person, he'll have to be in LA or yeah, wherever yeah. the office is. Because like right. in my view, like the only way you're going to actually get the right economic trade-off of a more junior person is they have a lot less experience, but they have a lot of energy to give. Yeah. And so you want to be able to channel that energy in the right way. And the best way to do that is actually being in person. Yeah. Right. And so like I, I, I feel pretty strongly about that in the sense that yeah. if we do shift hiring at some point, like the junior folks are going to be in person in an office. Yeah. In LA. I... um. When I was at Amazon is when Jeff Bezos implemented his shadow program. And I hadn't really heard of a program like this before, but he was like, yeah, I'm going to bring some promising young executive. They're going to follow me around for like half a year to a year to every meeting. And it's not that Jeff promised to be coaching them the whole way. He was just like, no, you're just going to observe me in meetings and go to meetings with me. And sometimes we'll get to chat on the way to the airport or in a car. But um, most of your learning is going to be through osmosis. And I think we have long associated apprenticeship models with blue collar work. It's like, oh, that's how you learn to, you know, like cook or be a blacksmith or something. And we had long thought that knowledge work wasn't conducive to like the type of apprenticeship model. But 
I actually think that's wrong, largely because, you know, I learned so much from Jeff just by being in meetings with him, not because I was his shadow, but because I was there to take notes or do something relatively junior. And I would just hear him thinking out loud constantly in meetings. And so I think if you follow someone around, not only do you pick up their habits, but you hear them talk or interact in enough situations that you build uh, a mental model of, oh, okay, this is what it's like, or this is one way it's done. And maybe you disagree with some of it and you're like, I would do it differently this way, but you do pick up a bunch of things where you're like, oh, okay, I see now what it takes to be at that level. Um, I see how they frame things um, and think about certain problems. And when you go to remote work, you just lose so many of those opportunities that are even just ambient. Like may, even if you had no explicit shadow program, you're in the office and you just see people behave in meetings or, you know, when they're like walking around and how they work. Um, it's a huge sacrifice. I, I think in many ways, tech is the absolute worst industry to model out these types of things because the margins typically are so high that you don't see these subtle losses in productivity. Like a company at Amazon, I wasn't surprised that Amazon was the first companies to say, oh, we got to get people back in the office somehow because Amazon, you know, a lot of, a lot of their business is retail, which is relatively low margin. Any loss in productivity is felt yeah. um, acutely. Um, and we, we probably need to go look at some really low margin business to understand really what the uh, immediate negative effects of remote work are. Um, it's probably like not going to be easy to spot that if it's like you're looking at Facebook or, or Google or someone like that with, you know, like 95% profit margins. Yeah. And, and actually going back to the meeting point, yeah, I think one of the things that is so uh, useful is learning from someone more experienced than yourself, how to run a meeting. Yeah. And a lot of that actually happens. It, there were a lot of subtle things yeah. and being able to pick up on body language and whatever. And I think zoom yeah. people have actually gotten quite good at feigning interest or feigning yeah. uh, that they're paying attention. And so yeah. you lose a lot of those context clues as in, Oh, I'm losing the room right now. Right. I need to, you know, change this up or, or kind of yeah. drive towards a, um, kind of different, different direction. Cause this meeting is not going as well that you lose the interaction that happens right after the meeting in the hallway, which is a lot of times actually is important from whatever yeah. happened in the meeting versus the decision maker, or yeah. the key takeaway, they give it to you right then. Yeah. And that's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, statement versus something that they would send to you via text or what it, it, you, there's just the fidelity of all of those interactions drops pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it, and we haven't really had this be an issue for us because we're just not doing that right now. Yeah. I actually think all of these AI note-taking tools, mm -hmm. terrible yeah. idea in the sense yeah. that fine as a first line of defense to make sure you have a transcript so you can go yeah. back and like check something you might've missed. Mm -hmm. But the, the process by, of having a scribe or having someone who actually takes notes, like gets mm -hmm. clear decision make, like that, that is actually valuable in of itself, that synthesis, because someone then actually can, can yeah. drive towards making sure that those things happen. Versus I actually think having some AI assign like to do's and takeaways, like it, I, I just don't think it's going to be as effective. I think right. it's useful as a archival purpose, yeah. but I don't actually think it, it is a, um, a substitute for just best practices and how we, like, I, I like how all of a sudden we went to go back to the, you know, process theory of the firm. We have like a hundred years of, of running corporations. And then the, the pandemic changes this and we just like, okay, we're going to throw a whole bunch of this out the window. Mm -hmm. And it's like, actually, there's actually probably a lot of value in, 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 in that. And, um, you know, Chesterton, Chesterton fence type situation. Yeah. Yes, there are things we can improve on the productivity side of things. Right. But I don't think wholesale throwing everything out and doing a radical shift. Yeah. You're just going to like magically improve the productivity. Of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really agree with you side conversation, back channel, part of, you know, that loss and going to Zoom meetings and not knowing when you can side conversation with any of your coworkers. Um, there have been a bunch of studies done about the function of gossip in various communities over the years. Like sociologists are like, what, what is the purpose of gossip? Why do we gossip as a species? And it turns out that gossip is a super effective form of 
informal communication that helps communities learn the norms of that community. It's like when you gossip about a coworker or something, you're learning like, oh, how do my other coworkers feel about that person's behavior or, or whatnot? And through that, you learn, okay, like this is kind of like what we believe in, what our shared values are. And it's very hard to do that with, with Zoom and everything when you have zero, zero number of conversations, you know? And you think about uh, like the most like famous example of trying to foster that is always, I feel like in tech, the um, Steve Jobs putting the bathrooms in the middle of the Pixar offices so that people would have to run into each other when they went to the bathroom, like run into people from other departments and things like that. Uh, I think there are other examples, but just, you know, just going to make coffee at the office and running into someone and having a little chat with them. And there's just like a lot of value hidden in all of that, that we, we lost. And I, I think back now too, there was a period where I remember Jeff at Amazon, like he went totally against the grain because people are like, oh, these the meetings are, they're costing all this time, but there would be certain meetings where he would communicate a decision and then later he would be like, oh, I thought we agreed on this decision. Why didn't it get communicated out to your sub teams? And he realized that just, you know, the game of operators, like as communication passes down through the people that were at the meeting to the next group, it just loses some transmission fidelity. And so he, he actually argued for some meetings being bigger, which is so against the current trend of like, make the meeting as small as possible, limit the number of people who can come, you know, in many companies that I, I was at, who got invited to a meeting was seen as like a political, like hammer that you could wield over people. It's like, oh, I really want to be in that meeting because it's a presentation to Zuck. And if I'm not there, it's like some bad sign for my career and people would haggle and fight over who got invited to things. But actually the way to look at meetings is really about this is about some <laughs> decision-making process and then some communication of some set of information. What's the right set of people to be there so that that is as efficient as possible? Um, if we only view meetings as costly, then I, I think we're missing some part of why we have them and what they're meant to be. And I think both need to be considered. Um, it's not that, you know, it's not that I love meetings either. Like I'm certainly invited to plenty of meetings that are a waste of my time, but um, there are other meetings that I can remember that probably changed the course of, you know, I don't know, Amazon strategy. <laughs> and, uh, if we didn't have them, if we were all remote work, like they probably wouldn't have happened the way that they happened. Yeah. yeah and I think people who are actually good at meetings, um, yeah. th you can view that as a negative in terms of they're, they're good political operators, but I actually think being an effective leader executive within a company of sufficient scale, being having good meeting hygiene and being a good meeting leader or facilitating a meeting and getting what you want out of the meeting. Yeah. If you're excellent at that, like it's actually an extremely powerful yeah. coordination tool mm -hmm. and motivation tool, like getting yeah. people on the same page because no one actually wants to be assigned work via like a, a ticket. Yeah. Like it, it, like this, I think it comes a little bit from the engineering culture of like, oh, like we should just create these systems and so we can replace the messiness of humanity. But like the reality is humans, this is how, this is our API. It's like a, a meeting yeah. is actually pretty Lindy. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it, it, it's, it's the bad meetings that create the whole bad yeah. rap for the, the mm -hmm. technology <laughs> versus yeah. if, if you actually have an effective meeting, yeah. they, can, they can be extraordinary in terms of the impact that they can have. So. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I like, I think, um, I, I, going back to your point, it's the yeah. experienced people that I actually think are, are the most in favor of remote work and mm -hmm. they're the ones who hold the power. Right. Yeah, like, so right. if you yeah. have kids or yeah. whatever, and you're like, wait a second, like, this is yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not like, I, I'm just kind of doing zoom calls all day. And I just kind of, I don't actually have to do that much deep work. I kind of react to people. I deal with HR problems. Mm -hmm. Your perspective is this isn't that bad. Like I had to do this before I can right. now do it at my house or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But I think the downstream effects within the company and the, the overall productivity of the people generating the work. Mm -hmm. Now, a certain set of engineers love the fact that they don't get interrupted and they have yeah. the deep work. Right. But if, if your company has other types of roles that are actually driving the business forward that involve any bit of collaboration, I can promise you being in person, you're going to have that much more of a productivity boost. Mm -hmm. Yes, with the expense of commute and, and yeah. kind of all the other stuff that sucks about having to go into an office. Right, right. I'm hopeful with the, 
the, the big crash in commercial real estate that maybe we'll have a chance to go back to rethink the open floor plan office and configure offices to have more offices, but also more shared space. Um, I think it was like in, I think it was in how buildings learn by Stuart brand that I, I kind of read about, um, I think some building at MIT where a bunch of different scientists would come together to work on kind of cross disciplinary projects and just the, they would all have their own office, but then there was a big sort of shared open space in the middle, but that was really reconfigurable. They had whiteboards on wheels and chairs on wheels and, and people would use that as an impromptu space to create different configurations of meeting spaces. And that's the balance I would love to see. Like I would love to see some more imagination when it comes to what's the right design of an office to balance individual work and individual like deep work with collaborative, um, you know, meetings and, you know, just collaboration in general. I, I think we're not there with the offices that I've seen. <laughs> what, what's the most uh, kind of creative or, or effective office you've ever worked out of in your, your career? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely not any of the recent ones because they've all been under sort of open floor plan based. Um, I don't know if I've ever worked at one that was ideal. I would say that, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm thinking about it on the fly and I don't know if this is true or not, but being on a film set is sort of an interesting test of it because you have a lot of different departments, um, that all have to independently work, but ultimately they do have to come together. And there's a lot more, there's been a lot of thinking about like what onset protocol needs to be to like manage that mess of like chaos to get a shot done. Um, I don't know. There may be something to borrow from that or learn from like onset protocol and how different departments balance their work to ensure like a good creative balance, maybe. I don't know. What about you, Dan? I don't know. Have, have you, like, what, what's your favorite office environment? Well, I've only really worked at, like, three companies from an office standpoint. And so Bain was interesting relative to Silicon Valley companies because all managers and partners had an office. Yep. And they were kind of these internal, they didn't get them near the windows. It was like right. kind of internal to the office building. Yeah. And that was private, but glass. Yeah. But that was meant so that they could actually facilitate calls. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting about that is the, you so you can think of like the partner is the person talking to the client most of the time. And the manager was like dealing with the team and yeah. like the associates were kind of sitting out towards the windows and bays. But the, it facilitated actually a lot of collaboration because the manager never had to find a conference room. Like yeah. it would just be like, come into my room, like my, my office, and then like, let's, let's get through to a decision. And every so often, if you had like a big enough team, you'd need to use some of the, the external kind of conference rooms. Yeah. But relative to Coinbase, where I think like, you know, as we got bigger offices over time, the biggest issue was also like, you would want a call room and then you're like yeah. trying to fight and you're like spending yeah. half your day, like going up and down the stairs. And so that like, yeah. that's not ideal. But, but, but to your point, I think that the interesting thing about the commercial real estate crash yeah. could really be that people actually now can get more incentive to, to do development in terms of like improving the office layout yeah. for what people want. You already have a lot of improved office space. It's probably vacant. So it's yeah. Like, Maybe that's even cheaper because it's kind of sunk cost. Yeah. But I, but I do wonder also if, if we kind of say, hey, look, productivity is increasing for the average startup, right? Whether that's AI driven or just frankly, another 10 years of, of, of development relative to like when I was starting out at Coinbase uh, uh, in terms of developer productivity and all that other kind of stuff is you just need fewer people, right? And so if you have fewer people on your team, yeah. You can give more space per person. And, and so for the same relative office at the scale of company, you can yeah. end up having a bunch of private offices and then, and then kind of the collaborative spaces or whatever. And so maybe, maybe that's actually yeah. where we head to. I, I can say that what, what single office I'm most jealous of that I've ever visited, which was on the Pixar campus, and it's where the animators worked. It was like going into a, a cave. <laughs> and each animator's office was decorated to their tastes 
it was in this really dark shared space. But one of them I remember was like a tree house with all these shelves and toys around it. Every one was like a womb. It really was like working out of a cocoon. Um, and obviously that was optimized for very individualized work. You know, each animator like wanted their particular aesthetic or vibe. But I think about every other office that I've ever worked out of. And, you know, obviously at Amazon, we kept growing so fast that we kept having to move offices. You, you could hardly have time to even personalize your office because, you know, in like three months, you've moved to a different office. But um, I think we should force companies to compete to make an office that's better for us than working from home. Um, like, I, I think they got complacent. And so, yeah, you should make an office that people want to come into that makes them more productive. That's ultimately what the office space should be. It, like someone working from their uh, bedroom, it, like it, that shouldn't beat an office. And if it does, it's, 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 there's some real problem with the office itself. Yeah, a place we could all work. We work. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, this is a bad joke. Uh, Eugene, I got to cool. run. Um, yep. Me yeah, too. It was a good great place chatting to, with yeah. you as always. Yeah, it was yeah, good to good see you guys. Great conversation, guys. Um, yeah, thanks, Eugene. We'll get you for the next banger in a year from now or two years from now, whenever it is. Okay. Sounds good. Cheers. Bye. Hey, everybody. If you're a business owner or founder like me, you'll want to know more about our sponsor, NetSuite. NetSuite provides financial software for all your business needs. Whether you're looking for an ERP tool or accounting software, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control you need to make better decisions faster. And for the first time in NetSuite's 25 years as the number one cloud financial system, you can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. That's no payment and no interest for six months. And you can take advantage of the special financing offered today. NetSuite is number one because they give your business everything you need in real time, all in one place to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity across every department. More than 36,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. If you've been checking out NetSuite already, then you know this deal is unprecedented. No interest, no payments. So take advantage of the special financing offer with our promo code at netsuite.com slash zen. That's netsuite.com slash zen to get the visibility and control your business needs to weather any storm. netsuite.com slash zen.